This conference, I'm this conference will now be recorded. <laughs> All right. So I don't know if we should wait for a few minutes. It looks like we have some more people joining, which is exciting. Right, well, I don't want to wait too long. I guess first I would like to um, welcome you guys to this book talk uh, on the South Dakota in Poems, which is an edited collection by Christine Stewart Nunez. Hey, I also have mine. <laughs> Um, I would also like to say, thank the South Dakota uh, Humanities Council for funding this presentation. Um, and with that, I look forward to the discussion that follows with Christine as well as other contributors. Thank you, Kelly. I really appreciate um, being with the Yankton Library tonight and being able to talk about um, South Dakota in poems. So a little bit about me, for those of you who don't know me, I um, teach at South Dakota State University and I've been there since 2007. And in 2018, I put my hat in the ring for um, the Poet Laureate of the, of the state. And I was uh, nominated to the governor and the governor said yes. And so that makes me the Poet Laureate from 2019 to 2023. And, you know, in the, so for those of you who don't know, um, for a long time in the state of South Dakota, the Poet Laureate was, was nominated for life, or not nominated, just nominated, um, chosen for, for life. And the last person to have that version of the Poet Laureateship was David Allen Evans. And actually, when he retired from SDSU, I was the one hired for his job. So it's kind of, kind of funny how things work out. But um, he decided that he didn't want to, quote, die in the post, as some of the other poet laureates have. And so he talked to the president of the South Dakota State Poetry Society, Bruce, Bruce Roseland, about a potential way to, um, to change the law. And so they lobbied to have the law changed and to make it every four years, just to give other people a chance to, to, to contribute to uh, the cultural, the growth of culture in our state. So the first person who had that role, that role, the first four-year term was Lee Ann Roropa, who is down at USD in Vermilion. And she did a great job. And then, um, like I mentioned, I was the, I've been the next one. And basically the South Dakota State Poetry Society puts a call out and anyone can apply. And in the application letter, you just write like what your credentials are um, for poetry and like what project that you would, you would pitch to promote poetry, reading and writing across the state. And that's the mission of the South Dakota State Poetry Society. And so, um, you know, I had had the idea of an anthology for a, for a pretty long time. Um, my friend Patrick Hicks at Augustana, he, uh, he did a poetry anthology in 2010, which I really admired and I was a part of. And he decided when he was putting that together that he would just ask poets who already had book published. And so he just, I think he did that for time's sake. Um, he was, he wanted to do this pro project, but he didn't have a lot of time to kind of go out and make the calls. So that's how he decided to, to choose. And then we just, the people who, whom he asked, we just submitted poetry that we wanted to have in the book. So I, I wanted to do it a little bit different. And my, my goal, my vision was to have uh, poetry being written fresh right here and now in the last few years. You know, fresh for the poetry world is like 10 years, you know, <laughs> um, not necessarily like yesterday, right? But, you know, in the last 10 years. And I wanted it to be open to not just South Dakota poets, but South Dakota affiliated poets. So poets who still write about South Dakota, poets who um, find 
uh, uh, their connections to South Dakota enduring. Maybe they'll come back someday. <laughs> um, and so my requirements were that they are at least living in, at least here for five years, or you had been here, grown up here somehow for five years, and that you were writing about the state and the people, the, the history, the culture, languages, like it was pretty open as long as you were, you're writing about life here in this, in South Dakota. So that was my vision. And I wanted, to, I, I had no idea how many poems I would get. In fact, I, I kind of joked that I was panicking, that I thought maybe I wouldn't get any. <laughs> so I had some students at, at SDSU who are going through old past petals, um, lit, or the journal that the South Dakota State Poetry Society uh, ed, puts out. And I edited it for several years, so I knew there were poems in there that were good. So I was like, here, go through all of these and you know, like tag all the ones you think are good. And if we get desperate, we can just like, you know, find the poets and see, because I was just worried that nobody would submit. And so I, for the first six months, I just spread the word and tried to get the most to get the word out. I, you know, tapped people on the shoulder. I sent calls out to libraries, wrote news newsletter pieces for things and um, just tried to get the word out. And then March 1st, 2020 was the deadline. So I got, my, my students were um, getting all those poems for me. So I got all the poems from the past cuddles and, the, and looking at South Dakota poets, right? Poets who already had books. I got poems from that, poems from that. And then I got all of these poems, like hundreds of poems submitted through the calls. And so then I had the really wonderful and difficult task of making selections. And basically um, I had this binder just like stuffed with possible poems. And so the first thing I looked for was excellent in, excellence in craft. And I looked really hard at like, what is there something that the poet's doing that is imagistic or sonic or you know a good story or what's happening here craft wise. And then I, I, I pulled them out and then that still made too much <laughs> for the book because I didn't want it to be one of the, like those Norton anthologies if everyone remembers from their, from their classes, you know, like 400 pages. And we probably didn't have the money to do that either. So, um, so then, um, yeah, because the South Dakota State Poetry Society and the South Dakota Humanities Council and many, many, many good donors to the project that's how I got the budget to do this. Um, so basically I went through, then I said, okay, well, what, you know, what are people talking about? Let me look thematically. Um, what, what are, so, you know, you can't have a dozen interstate poems or a dozen snow poems or a dozen um, harvest poems, right? So I picked a few <laughs> from those categories and I picked a few, um, that were the best or, you know, and then I tried to get at least, you know, like if, if there was one po person who had five really amazing poems, well, you know, they only got one or two. Like there's only people, only, there are a few people, like maybe 10 who got more than one poem and then the rest got one. So then I just, I just took out their poems and um, just found the one that I thought fit thematically and um, gave some diversity in terms of uh, st structures, themes, voices, you know, those kinds of things. I really wanted uh, to carefully think about those things in the anthology. So that's what I did. And so there's 90-ish poem poets and 100-ish poems and, uh, I put them together in conversations. So if the introduction I talk about it, um, this book being a conversation among poets and South Dakota affiliated poets about the, about it through poetry. And um, you can, I kind of grouped them thematically <laughs> or imagistically. I think that there's a lot of ways you could, I could have chosen to group these. You know, I could have did it geographically. I could put all the poets from this side of the state and then like circled back or that would have really challenged me. <laughs> that would have really challenged me though. Cause like, then what do we do with Teresa who doesn't live here anymore, right? Um, so I could have done it that way. I could have done it alphabetically. I, there, I could have done it maybe through the time that the poem was written across time. But I thought it would be a lot more 
interesting to kind of put some poems that were similar talking together, you know, like when you, when you go to a party and there's these little clutches of people, you know, if before COVID, do you remember parties or do you remember gatherings <laughs> when you would go to them and there would be little clutches of people having talks about different things. And so that's kind of how I imagined the poems being organized. And that's what I did. So then I, I, I found, um, this uh, Keith Braveheart's piece, A Landscape. I really fell in love with this um, piece of art and he he gave me permission to use it for the cover. Um, I uh, got it designed by uh, uh, Taylor Livingston who is here in Brookings at Upframe Creative. She does a really great job and wrote an introduction and I found some other poets laureate to say good things about everyone's work together and it was just a really fun fun project and uh i'm not going to do another one so don't ask <laughs> um instead because that is like this is so hard this is so much time i can't even tell you but uh, what I do hope to do a little bit, we can talk about this more at the end, is I hope to start publishing through the South Dakota State Poetry Society, individual uh, South Dakota poets and their books. Um, so kind of working on that project right now. So that's, so I think it'll be easier to work with one poet at a time than 90 poets at a time. <laughs> So, um, so given that context and uh, that introduction, let's go ahead and hear from the writers that are the contributors and writers that we have with us tonight. Um, there are four, um, Teresa Zimmerman, Marilyn Kratz, Kratz, Brenda Johnson, and Jamie Sullivan. And so what we'll do is we'll just go through, um, each person can introduce him or herself and then read their, con their con contributions to the book. And then we'll go through again and we'll talk a little bit about um, impressions and, and th thoughts about the anthology. And then we'll open it up for questions. So read poems, impressions, Q&A. Okay. All right. So Teresa, I'm just going to pick on you. You're on the top of my list here. Would you care to go first, please, and read your contribution? Sure. My name is Teresa Erskine Zimmerman, and I lived in Sioux Falls until I was 13 and my family moved. But of course, my whole childhood was spent there. So everything I write about it, when I write about it, is from a child's point of view or memory. It's called Hometown Portrait. And this one, I've got to tell you a little bit about it since we're in Yankton. This poem was uh, conceived of because of an event in Yankton. Um, I subscribed to South Dakota Magazine and an art article came with an artist with pictures of the state and I recognized my hometown area and I just gasped because I knew exactly, exactly what it was. So this poem is from that episode, Hometown Portrait. The painting captured exactly winter sunlight upon the snow in the park, attracting my full attention. I heard again our childhood laughter ricocheting among a stand of staid black walnut, felt the scratch of wood, wool trappings that muffle cold, but not enthusiasm, as I inhaled deeply the crisp air to determine through instinctive means if more snow for which I keened was on the wing. Thank you. Next will be Marilyn. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Marilyn Kratz. I've lived in Southeastern South Dakota all my life. I'm a retired elementary teacher. My poem is called Morning Rejuvenation and it's sort of, uh, the theme is something that I, I'm living with nowadays, and that's facing aging. Life gets very interesting during the different phases of it. So this is called Morning Rejuvenation. Each morning, I sit in front of my magnifying makeup mirror, my telephone on my lap, and try to ignore the lines I see around my eyes and mouth. I phone my older sister, now a widow, to be sure she's alive. She asked me to do that. 
my hand knows the pattern of her phone number because I've punched those numbers countless times. After I've dialed, I will hear one of three things. A busy signal revealing she's already up and making calls. Unanswered rings telling me she's either dead or off on an errand. Or her cheery voice saying, good, good morning. If she answers, we talk as one-handedly I apply eyebrow pencil where I once had eyebrows and mascara to make my eyes pop and maybe look younger. I cradle the receiver between my shoulder and chin when I need both hands to open my box of blush. As I brush soft pink onto my cheeks and just a bit on my chin, hoping to imitate the radiant glow of youth, my sis and I make plans for the day or discuss family problems. Sometimes we're both really rushed, so the call is brief, but at least I've made contact. Our morning ritual convinces us both we still have important things to do where we must show up wearing makeup. Sometimes I wonder how much good my call does, because even if my sister doesn't answer her phone, I don't go to her house to see if she's dead. I don't plan to ever consider that possibility. I'll just continue our routine until we both lose interest in our morning rejuvenation. Thank you. And next up is Brenda. Well, um, I chose a, a poem to read that is a little more recent than the publication of this uh, called hidden in plain sight. Eyes burn from the biting wind off the frozen Missouri River this late February day. Pandemic news and the death after death wears my soul. Snow caught in the river's stationary ice waves repeats in endless loops, dead of winter panorama. Yet, the outdoors still offers repose. Gray, wizened trunks of undressed trees cluster along the riverbank with grasses flattened by wind and snow. A large bird silhouettes against the blue-gray cloudless sky. The bird is flapping along the shore with a crooked branch three times his body length, trailing awkwardly behind. He disappears among the lifeless trees. The tallest Thulan cottonwood rests along the shore by a campground and a parking lot. In the crown of the tree, among forked branches by the trunk, is a deep mass of loosely woven limbs. On the bow beside this nest, an eagle watches her mate land beside the nest and push pull a branch into place. The massive tree groans in wind gusts. And the avian couple flutter as they balance and gaze at the enormous old nest renovation before them. From 80 feet below, I see the sky visible between woven limbs of the precarious nest. Weeks and many river walks later, the winter has finally subsided. Spring thaw features ice cubes among the frozen slabs at water's edge. Resilient eagles have added bulk to their nest. The centurion cottonwood with its swelling leaf buds may soon camouflage noisy fledglings as they learn what they need to know in this cycle of new life that surely continues. 
Thank you. you. You still got a lot of uh, South Dakota imagery. There we go. The cold, the snow, the birds, and the cottonwood. <laughs> so, and, and I was this, tracking them. <laughs> well, I, and I chose this story because the eagles are still on the nest. And if you cared to see the eagle on the nest, you go to the Welcome Center at Lewis and Clark Recreation Area turn due south down to the edge of the river and look east. There you will see this tree <laughs> and you will see the eagle in the nest and um, they're, they're still sitting on the eggs at this time, which would be a natural uh, uh, progression. And we hope, um, we hope for some little ones. <laughs> uh, and Back in uh, 1990 or so, um, there weren't many eagles here mm -hmm. because of the um, pesticides that had been used and all. And now uh, they have recovered enough that we are seeing eagles um, that we can watch from the parking lot. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. And Jamie, you're up next. Uh, you know, Christine, I want to thank you first just for all the work that went into putting this book together. I mean, it's amazing. It's, uh, it's kind of, it amazes me how many fine poets there are in South Dakota. And, you know, I, even, I think the book is designed extremely well. I like, like everything about it, the cover. So, a lot of work, and I and thank you. So I, I'm Jamie Sullivan, and I teach English over at Mount Marty University now, and uh, I've been there for a long time. Uh, I couldn't count the years, but it's more than 30 years. So the, uh, the poem I'm going to read is uh, it's called Night Fields, and I don't know exactly where this came from because uh, it has to do with tass detasseling corn, something which I've never done. But just my, my imagination, I guess. So teenage girls detasseling corn days after a downpour step through puddles and pick up toads small enough to sit on a penny. Eva sp spreads four tiny digits on the pad of her thumb and hums, putting the creatures into her pocket and moves stalk to stalk, dropping pollen in the mud. At home, she throws jeans across her bed and turns under the shower's hot torrents. In a cloud of herbal essence, she pushes her head into the pillow as from denim burrows, toads emerge, taste the air from mosquitoes, and ease into her dreams. So, Christine, do you want me to read this other one too? Yeah, sure. We have plenty of time. Okay, well, they're not too long, so you won't go to sleep in the middle of it, I don't think. I hope. Uh, this poem is called Hiawatha. It was, uh, you know, I I became aware of it from uh, Harold Ironshield, who uh, I uh, bumped into occasionally, and uh, he used to take some some of the native people in the area. This up by this was up by Canton, South Dakota, where there there now is a golf course where there used to be a place uh, that, that the poem is about, and he used to take some people there. To, uh, to honor the people that are buried in the cemetery there. So the, uh, I think I have the name of the place in the poem, so I'll go ahead and read it. If, it, if anybody's interested, I can tell you more about it. So tanned men, the poem's called Hiawatha. Tanned men in shorts, polo shirts, build caps, tee off, feeling the grip of glove, club and spikes biting into the turf. Clover and aftershaves scent the air. Between the fourth and fifth fairways are 121 unmarked graves. I mean, a Hiawatha Asylum for Insane Indians, a name that hangs in the air after the bricks are gone. Healers, ghost dancers, men with visions and songs in their heads, lost sons, lost daughters, gone to this place of padlocks and strange speech. One elder lived in a skull 16 years without visitors, remembering campfires in cottonwood forests, 
wild plum sweet on his tongue. He stared through days of leather straps and chamber pots. <clears throat> Gone are the schemers flush with government money who left hedges around the graveyard in the rough. Source of double bogeys, golf ball eaters, these unmarked deaths. Almost gone are the femur deep in the berm, teeth in the roots of the grass, the swaying blue strum, excuse me, the swaying blue stem blesses them. Two teeth, big day, Maggie Snow, long time owl woman, and the others who are only a name. Thanks. Thank you. That was it's such a powerful poem. Um, since we have a little bit of uh, time in terms of reading, I'm going to read uh, a, just a section of a collaborative poem that I put together. Um, I can tell you the background of it a little. It's the Badlands and Wind. So I'll read the first um, stanza, the first section, and then I'll tell you the story behind behind it really quick. Night sky. Set Steady the scar starlight, diamond bright, outlining the buttes against a deepening midnight. Start here with this wet moon, with summer's lunacy, with lost words and time and breath. Slip into a sky rhythm, a night rhythm of twinkling stars and syncopated planets. The crescent moon hangs, a glass bowl of milky whiteness ready to spill. Sip lost moon rays and taste the light born millennia ago in star furnaces when clay mud sees birds, the silent history beneath our feet. So there are six um, sections to that poem. And, and uh, so a different people have different perspectives on whether or not an editor should put her or his own poems in the book. And I decided to not put my own poems in this book, but <laughs> um, I did some collaborative poems with, uh, some, with various writers that I, I did workshops on in the Badland, for the Badlands and the Black Hills um, Main, at Main Street Square in Rapid City. So, you know, there's those sculptures. If you've been to Rapid City and Main Street Square, there's those two sets of sculptures. And with that project, we did a series of workshops and people submit and people also submitted poems to me about the Badlands and about the Black Hills. And because I'm not from there and I've never spent much time in that area, I felt it was, they wanted me to write the poems, but I thought, no, I'm just gonna do it this way because it would be more representative of the of the people. And so kind of what I did, who lived there, right? <laughs> who, who visited there a lot. So what I did is I kind of, I kind of grabbed the language and the lines and some of the poems and I kind of filtered them all together and quilted them together into this collaborative poem. And then the way it was, um, performed, it was performed chorally. So there was a different, there was, um, there were three voices. And so the poem broke up into three different, like voices would chime in. And so it was performed chorally with, in the Rapid City at two different events um, in 2014 and 2017, but the poems hadn't been collected anywhere. They just kind of felt a little bit like a piece of ephemera, like they're performed, but then they, they just went away. So I thought this was a good uh, place to gather those the, to gather those two projects up. And so I transformed them from the choral versions that I had written into these um, to collaborative poems. So my name and the other contributors are at the end in the in the notes contributors notes. But um, technically, I wasn't the solo writer. I was just the facilitator of sorts. But yeah, okay, so now let's go through and um, everyone can go back through again, starting with Teresa and give some impressions or ideas or some things that you were thinking um, about when you were reading the anthology. Oh, when I was reading the anthology, I was remembering my training in verse writing about poems being um, articles of praise. And I was also, child again because I was hearing words that I had not heard for many years like shelter belt came to mind and uh, there was a feeling for me that I was home and um, I considered it the the book in total kind of a you would call it an axis mundi it's where heaven and earth meet 
And all of those poems, whether they were in the city or in the country, I felt like the sky was always in there, almost always in there, or the earth was always in there. There were birds. Um, even in the, a haiku, somebody was riding a bull and raising his hand to the air. And I thought, it's just an astounding book for me, since I haven't been there in 50 years except to visit. I felt like I was home. And that was, and the linguistics of South Dakota writers was completely familiar to me, the, the cadence of the language. And when you move away, you don't have that anymore. But when I read it, I completely knew where I was from. It was an astounding experience for me. And I, I don't think there was a poem I didn't enjoy. I liked the, um, because of the spareness of the population and the huge size of the state or the land, which is almost like a blank page, I liked the spare poems. I liked the haiku. And there was one by, um, let's see who wrote it. A Rural Ride by Jane Helm and he Heitman Healy. It kept com comes to mind all the time. You know, it just pops back into my mind. So I do like the spare poems, but on the whole, there wasn't one I didn't value. So I've really enjoyed it. Um, Marilyn? Great. What are some of your thoughts? Well, this is such a remarkable book. You know, I'm a native South Dakotan, so I could appreciate as as written so much of what was South Dakota about it. Starting right away with that first poem, uh, written by Elizabeth M. Benkert, called uh, "The State Dessert Is Cooking." I mean, right away there you go. And her whole poem had so many unique things about South Dakota, a state of which I'm very very proud to be a member, uh, a resident. Uh, but the poems. Um, really give a feel, as Teresa said, a feel for South Dakota. The physical appearance of the land and then the the soul of the people. I, I just felt like you, you 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 got to know the soul of the people. Um, and there were particular ones that I made notes on um, because I love to garden and especially flowers. I loved Room for a Small House by Ruby Wilson, which just is about even wildflowers, flowers I just absolutely love. Uh, Snow Blind by Todd Williams, you know, we, we all face those fears in the wintertime of being stuck out in the snow. Um, it's just, we have every kind of weather in South Dakota, and I think they were just about all touched upon in, the, in this book. Um, and, you know, Bruce Roseland is a, is a good longtime friend, and I love his poetry, but his, the one he wrote in this book, the, A Prairie Prayer, reflects how so many of us feel about South Dakota and the fact that we know that it's not always easy to live here, but we, we're glad we have the courage to be here because of all the state has to offer. And then the section on West River, I like the way you put the, the book together, uh, Christine, you know, as you said, conversations. Uh, being East River all my life, whenever I go West River, I'm on vacation, you know. <laughs> I, by the time I get to Chamberlain, I'm on vacation. And putting them together there is like, when I read that section, if I get if I get lonely for the Black Hills, I just read that section because <laughs> all of those poems about it. Um, I like the, um, uh, oh, uh, Marcella Redmond's poem about uh, Brace Yourself. I just had a laugh because hers is about a Scandinavian family getting together for Thanksgiving. My heritage is Germans from Russia, but, I could really relate to all the noise and the breakage and everything going on in those family gatherings. And then Brenda, uh, I loved your poem, We Can Tomatoes, because I can the tomatoes when I was a little girl and I remember all those, the, the visuals you put in that were just really outstanding. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm so glad to included uh, the bios at the end of the book because Every time I read a poem, I read the bio first, because just to kind of get that person in my mind and reflect on their poetry. And then that's all I'll say, except I have to say hi to my friend Beverly Barons down there in the corner. She's joining us from Chicago. <laughs> <Hi>. <laughs> um, 
Thank you. And yes, uh, you sh I think you might, you and Teresa, Beverly and Teresa are the farthest away from uh, from us today. Usually, usually Todd, Todd Williams joins us from the, from Saudi Arabia, um, where he's living. Um, but I don't know what must have, either he did, either he didn't see the post or we didn't post it or he didn't, be, wasn't able to stay up till like three in the morning <laughs> tonight, but he often does join us. So you, so now the two of you get that, that, that award. Um, so yeah, Brenda, what were you thinking about, about this book? Well, uh, there was something, uh, there's a link between, uh, you, Christine and, uh, this area of the state. Um, the, uh, Preston Dakotan published American Life in Poems for, for several years. Uh, it came out once a week. And this was edited by Ted Kuzer. And you uh, mentioned somewhere or another that as a grad student at University at Lincoln, you, uh, it was your job to help select, initially select some of the poems. And you were told to look for images or conversations that readers relate to. And um, to me, this anthology is for readers. Mm -hmm. It's set up for readers. Um, when you thumb through, you find something that you like as an image, and then maybe you read a poem about that. So uh, uh, I think while um, we're all fortunate to be um, poets, uh, persons that are in the anthology. Um, it is an experience for readers that is what I get from this anthology. And uh, a way that I think would be really fun to use the book would be to have a group of friends or a book club um, and have them find the image that that speaks to them and then look at a few poems in that and tell others about that i think um it would be very enjoyable and so uh, i really appreciate the way you've put uh you've lifted readers to a high level in this anthology so thank you Thank you. Yeah, I um, I've been asked to a couple one book club and peers having me to come visit them this summer, and so I would love that's a I would love more book clubs to to um, you know use this book and discuss it and you know in high school in classrooms too. Um, I think it would be a really great. I, I remember when I was a kid and a writer. Um, learning that there are other writers in the world <laughs> you know when writer once upon a time there was a writer who came to visit the school i went to and i thought it was just incredible to meet a living real writer and so it would be really great and because i think that even though even even if you know i can't be everywhere like a lot of towns and a lot of communities are covered <laughs> by the anthology and and for us for 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 a child or a student to know that like that writer just lives down the road or you know in the next town over is a pretty powerful thing i i don't think a lot of people like jamie said knew that there are so many good writers in the state or affiliated with the state and and i didn't either and i've been here for a while and every time i go somewhere i shake the trees few trees there are i shake the trees for poets and 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 I was so I was so happy that there are so many more poets to meet um, in this anthology because I've met a lot of them or I am meeting a lot of them now and it's it's just a joy it's really a joy so thanks for mentioning that I hope that um, some more uh, uh, because of COVID I I haven't visited any schools as poet laureate um, and maybe that will change the next the next year or so um, but it would be great for schools and book clubs to to read this yeah. together. Yeah. All right. Our library here in Yankton has 10 copies. I think that uh, they were saying 
uh, which would be, uh, you know, it's a resource sitting right there for you. For you. Thank you to the uh, Yankee Community Library. Mm -hmm. Jamie, what about you? Um, well, I don't know. I'm, my thoughts are sort of scattered at the moment. Uh, you know, I, I was, uh, it was curious that uh, Teresa mentioned canning tomatoes because uh, we, we can tomatoes by Brenda because I like that one a lot too although not probably not for the same reason since I've never canned tomatoes I haven't canned tomatoes and I haven't detasseled corn so I'm out of it you know uh, but I was really struck in Brenda's poem you know by by the structure of the poem how she uses uh, repeated lines that uh, tie the poem together and so anyway I like that a lot so I, you know one of the things that always amazes me about an anthology uh is is how poems come from so many different places you know we, we can't help it even if you're trying to imitate somebody you end up sounding different and we all sound so different when we write about such different things and and uh so i just find that really fascinating so one, one of the things about south dakota you know is that and, and many of these poems show is that you know we're just sort of uh dwarfed by the landscape and, and in a way that's not true in other places and you know south dakota would not be the place to come to to write about uh, big cities uh, mm -hmm. but it is a place to write about the you know the sky and, uh, and the fields and, uh, and the natural world however what, uh, one of the poems that really struck me in here also was uh and maybe just because it's a reminder that it's a it is a big world uh i wonder if anybody else remembers uh, daria Darla Beale's poem, Outsourcing. Maybe yep. maybe I can just read that quickly. Is that, does that count as a comment? <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I just, uh, I got a kick out of this just because uh, and it's written like a, like a prose poem. So it doesn't, uh, uh, it's on page, my glasses are fading out. Page 64, if you have your book right there. Uh, anyway, let me just read it. And then maybe I'll just say a word or two about it. So I call an 800 number to register my Quicken and reach a man named Gary. I am in another country, he says. All of us are far apart, I think, but do not say. I'm in India. Have you ever been? I wonder if he's seen tigers prowling saltwater marshes. He asks about our snowstorm. And I say the coast had snow, but here in the middle, we giggle. It made national news. We always have snow. I have never seen snow in my life, Gary confesses, both sin and desire. Tell me what snow is like. I tell him this winter snow is beautiful. It falls like down when the wind is still, the snow tests. I'm having trouble seeing. The snow rests on bare branches that weave the sky together. Sometimes it falls in wet flakes and freezes white. Sometimes it falls as rain and freezes clear. From my roof, an icicle hangs, thick as my thigh. It glistens like a cold fish. I want to break it off and keep it, but I'm afraid it will slip through my fingers and shatter. <clears throat> Last night, I dreamt I walked into a tiny room, barely a foyer, a traditional place and the floor was covered with shattered glass. The man I was with ripped the hand from mine and turned away as if as if it were my fault. It's quiet here, I say. It's quiet on the line. I tell Gary, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm butchering this poem. I tell Gary, I hear him breathing in the hush. I almost fall in love. So I thought that was quite delightful just because it's a, it you know one thing that i like is uh when you read along and you're surprised you know uh, and this poem just has all kinds of surprising turns in it and, and it shows that south dakota is connected to to india <laughs> yeah i i liked that poem too i i darla is a friend of mine and um i keep i keep choosing that poem for projects like i keep going back to that poem because i just and for this and of all the ones that were her she submitted personally for this project like that was the one that i thought gave this outside kind of like this moment of trying to describe south dakota to someone 
who's never been here or this this aspect of South Dakota to someone who's never been here. Um, before, I mean, I'm a, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Iowa originally, and I went to school in Nebraska. And so I've spent, aside from the time I lived in Arizona and Turkey, like the country of, um, I have lived most of my life in this space, but I never would have imagined that I could be influenced by the weather as much as we are here. I mean, it's just so second nature to, to like know what the weather is going to be and to take it into consideration and have like all, like different versions of plans for snow or, you know, and like uh, having a winter coat and then a real winter coat and then like a real, real winter coat. <laughs> like, you know, it's just, um, <laughs> you know, it, so I, I wanted to get, I wanted to capture that, but I didn't want to over, you know, I didn't want it to be too much of a theme because there's a lot of snow, there's a lot of snowballs. <laughs> there's a lot, there's a lot of them and just some, some vision, so. Being speaking of winter coats, Christine, if you were a teacher, you had a recess duty coat for winter in South Dakota. <laughs> and that was the downfield one. <laughs> yeah, that's it's funny because um, you know, I've noticed like my friends were my friends lived in Alaska and then the range for weather for their kids to be outside was like, you know, they could be out in like, you know, 30 below and here they can be out in like 10 below, but then like other places, like it, they can't be out in like 10 degrees or 20 <laughs> degrees. And like, we just like send the kids out, you know, it, send them out no matter what, pretty much that's, that's yeah. it. Yeah. So are there any questions um, for us from, or any, any one person or for me, from those of you who are listening or those participating? I mean, for each other, <laughs> it could be any kinds of questions. Mm. When when do when do most of you uh, the the writers when do most of you I mean what's your I don't know I guess I have a handful of questions what uh, when do you write how much do you write uh, do you try to write every day do you write when when you just when you feel like it and anybody can take that question <laughs> I'll jump I'll jump. jump in because I write. Um, <clears throat> specific events that occur in my life that um, one of my instructors said when you're you know when you're in the poem and when I'm in a poem that's when I write you know when something happens like I saw that painting that my poem refers to and it was physically startling to me to see how accurate the painting was and that I recognized the location from the art and I had to write about it. I had to write about it. I didn't, it, there was no question. It was going to be a poem. And when things like that happen in my life, that's when I write a poem. And I always observe everything, but it's mostly an emotional connection. It's got to be a poem. Yeah. In fact, that's where, it, when I started writing for it, I mean, I've been a writer for over 50 years and mostly wrote for children's magazines. But one day I was so upset about something that the only thing I could do was just write about it, and it turned out to be a poem, which has subsequently been published already. But I would never have thought of writing poetry, except that it had to be, I just had to write those words, and, mm -hmm. and I liked doing it, and so I've never quit. But I, I'm not much of a schedule person, and I, I write a newspaper column now, so I have a lot of different kind of writings I have to do, but uh, I, I'm like you too, and something stirs me, then I want to write a poem about it. Mm -hmm. Just whenever, you know, being tired, I can write whenever I want to, but I'm, I don't do it on any regular schedule at all. Right. I'm, I'm going to jump in again because I'm like you. I never wrote a thing except um, functional papers until I was 47 and I graduated from college. So I never, ever wrote anything prior to that. So it's, you know, it may have something to do as well with that. When you have time in life to write, that you know, that's when it, when you you think you have to document something, and uh, so yeah, that's how. And it's mine isn't routine. If I I'm not business like about it. <laughs> it was very unusual. Even I would submit a poem to anything, except it was such a natural for South Dakota. You know, it, it was it was just a natural thing to do. 
but not business-like about it, no. I get inspired by the South Dakota, the past pedal deadlines, you know, pretty soon it's time for spring. <laughs> I should write a spring poem, you know, so that is my <laughs> Yeah, deadlines are a little, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I, I I used to write that way until I started the PhD program. And I thought, well, if I'm going to do this for reals, <laughs> like it's going to be part of my job, I better get my butt in the chair every day. And so maybe it's not every day, but, you know, I, I sit for hours a week and work on writing. And what I found is that at, although at the beginning I had to wait for the inspiration, now I I can kind of gather that inspiration in more readily. And then when I sit down to write, it it moves through me a little bit faster. Not that the drafts are any better, because they're always <laughs> bad at the beginning. But that but I don't have to sit there and think, oh, what am I going to write about? You know, like it's all it it's it's there to to start to work on. So I think that's one of the benefits of having a daily writing practice or a weekly writing practice is that, you know, you're, you're, you get used to it and you get so that you don't have to wait for those moments, unless that's how you want to write. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. Just if you, if you feel like you want to try something new or to push through that, um, that's always a good way to do it. I mean, I started just writing words from the dictionary because I would sit there and I wouldn't have anything to write about. So I was like, oh, I'm just gonna read the dictionary because you can't check your email or you can't go online during writing time. So then I would just get the dictionary, like the literal dictionary out and, and yeah, it doesn't take long for words to inspire me. Have, what other have, questions have, do you have? Have you heard what uh, Billy Collins says, uh, you know, Billy Collins, most of you probably know, have heard of him, uh, but he's he's a very well-known poet. He says the toughest thing about being a poet is figuring out what to do with the other 23 and a half hours a day. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's exaggerating a bit, but. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, I, had, like, I told someone like this experience I had with Billy Collins the other day where I had read like a whole book of his, right? And I was like, oh yeah, okay. He's like, he's a really good writer. Yeah, I like these poems. But then I heard him read and I was like, oh my gosh, I didn't know he was funny. <laughs> like, it was the most embarrassing. It was so embarrassing. Like I didn't know that he was supposed to be funny until I heard him read it. And I was like, oh my gosh. So anyway, that's a true confession. I feel really dumb, but like now I read him more and I'm like, oh, okay, no, I get it. He's supposed to, he's really funny. You know, you bring up an interesting point because I'm in a writing group. I do write regularly, but COVID has kind of balled that up for a while. But um, I would always tell people, you should hear the poem, you know. And so we got into a huge debate over, are poems audio or are they to be seen in print? And I'd like to hear some views on that because I'm I'm the only poet in my writing group. So they don't know what to say to it, but I keep insisting they need to hear the poem. And I'd like to know what you think. I think it's how you learn. I myself have to read the, I like to hear them out loud, like tonight, this was fun. But I want to read it myself and see those words on the paper. That's the only way I can really get the whole thing. I just have to read it. But I like to hear them too. But but mm -hmm. I, I maybe don't understand them as well unless I can read those words myself. Okay. But that's my the type of learner I'm, I guess. That's what they say anyway, you know, different types of learner. Yeah, I mean I think I think poetry is very closely tied to the to the voice. And uh, I have to remind myself of that sometimes and and uh, you know, when I'm trying to write, uh, read it out loud, right? You know, I, it's uh, you can hear all. Sometimes I don't notice that until I try to read before a group, and then I'm embarrassed because I there's something I didn't hear and didn't notice until I had an audience to read to. Yeah. Um, but it's uh you know it's there. Uh, of course, you can't. One of the crazy things about poetry today is you can't say anything that covers all poetry because then you think of somebody like uh, E. Cummings who was writing back in the 30s or so. You know, he wrote poems that can't be read out loud. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the words are all spliced together in strange ways. 
and it simply can't be read out loud. And then he writes other stuff that's really beautiful that, that is very uh, melodic and can be read out loud. So, you know, I can relate to what you're saying about reading out your own work out loud, even, you know, as you're working with it. I hardly, well, I guess I should say I never get anything ready to submit to any kind of publication unless I have read it out loud because that is the only way you hear the errors you've made. Yeah. But I have to read it out loud before it's done. I, that, that for me anyway. I have to read it out loud before I consider it to be finished. One of the things that I've realized about myself when I do readings is that the the more I read the poem out loud, the more I feel, even though it's so, still my own poem, the more I feel like I can play with the set, like play with the lines and the sentences a little bit more than when like it's a fresh poem. It's so weird, but there are poems that I've read a lot out loud that I just own. Like I own them more with, even though they're still my poems, I own them more than fresh poems. And so like I have a new book coming out in June called The Poet and the Architect. And my my husband just designed the cover today, so it's really exciting because the the editor the publisher let him design it, um, and he's the architect in the poet and the architect. So, anyway, I I've noticed that um, those are sort of fresher poems, and that I I really want to read them out loud more, even to myself before I give readings now, because I, I've realized that, and I might be this close to starting to memorize my own poems. I've really resisted <laughs> that over the years because it's so daunting. I mean, it's so scary to me, but I think I, I think I might be close to to moving into that realm of commitment. <laughs> so, um, it's almost it's almost eight o'clock, and I know that um, Kelly, um, we, we're we're gonna kind of like maybe not totally wrap it up, but maybe around eight o'clock kind of wrap up. So, are there any other questions or um, any other thoughts? as we kind of think about wrapping up or Kelly did you have any questions or anything or I don't have any questions but I would love to uh, tell you how much I loved this <laughs> edited collection um <laughs> like I felt like I was driving down the interstate and catching glimpses <laughs> of just like the diverse uh regional identities that we get here in South Dakota and I think a lot of times South Dakota is kind of assumed to be all the same type of people but we're so different here and I think like you did a really good job of including poems that demonstrate that and like just this quality of the poems um that were submitted really is top notch Okay. Yeah. I and I, have, I really go ahead. I did have one more comment. Um, you had said something about work that we were working on or had recently worked on. And I had a family member approach me wanting to do a memoir for the family in poetry. He my cousin and I both love poetry, and he says, Why don't we do it for a holiday? So we did actually, I don't know if you can see it. Let's see if I can get the we made a poem book for Christmas for our family members called Presence, and it's a he said, she said kind of, you know, I wrote, I submitted 20 poems, he submitted 20 poems, and what's crazy fun about it was the energy that comes out of the book when those poems go together, and I didn't know what he was going to submit, and he had no idea but over the course of editing and stuff we kind of meshed them together and it created an energy none of us neither of us had anticipated which was really fun so i can understand why you've had fun doing this because you just don't know what you're getting you know the family members loved it we you know nowadays you can self-publish so much so we just self-published it but it was that was real i'd never written poetry with someone else or collaborated like that with someone else but it was really fun it was really a fun thing to do so families love getting poems um i didn't think you know i thought oh they don't all like this but they really did because they were more personal they recognized things in the poems from the family members so i would encourage people when they think of writing to do something a little different I mean, you're you're still writing, but 
collaboration was fun although it is hard work with one other person when you want your poem to be just so you know but anyway that's what that's what i'm working on that's amazing i have never like to get two poets in the same family so that's pretty amazing that's awesome it was very yeah, unusual so let's, let's but, round um, it let's let's go ahead and round it out by saying um what we're all working on our our news and then we'll we'll say we'll wrap it up for kelly so i said that my book the poet and the architect is coming out in june from terrapin books and so you can find that on christinestuartnunez.com information coming out about that and teresa has been working on her collaboration book yeah uh marilyn what about you well, I am I am toying with the chapbook idea. Beverly and I are kind of working together on something. Uh, it's still too new to tell anybody about it, I think. <laughs> but it's exciting and it's fun and it gives me something to do. It really keeps us going. Yeah. Great. Brenda, what about you? Just uh just writing. Just writing? Okay. Jamie? Uh, well, I try to try to write every day, but what, what that gives me is uh, notebooks and notebooks full of, of junk. And uh, I, I was figuring the other day, I, it probably takes me about uh, 100 pages of nonsense to, to finally get on to something that look, looks good. So I'm working, but not, you know, slowly. <laughs> right. Well, I'm I'm giving. Uh... Um, a workshop on manuscript on submitting manuscripts um, at, for the South Dakota State Poetry Society, and it's on the website or the face, Facebook, I think. Um, and I think there's still room. I'm limiting it to 25 people, but it's free. And if that would give you some inspiration on how to kind of pull some poems out of the <laughs> the pile, um, I, I also think too. Sometimes if you think you have a book but you're not there, it will help you kind of give you the gas to finish up, you know, because you're like, I almost have a book. I almost have, you know, 40 poems or 50 poems or however many um, you're aiming for, or you have an idea or an arc or some themes. So um, I wanna, I've wanted. i been trying to do a few more of those uh, workshop-based um, workshop based talks through the South Dakota State Poetry Society. And so um, if you have any ideas, if anyone has, has any ideas for workshops, um, please let me know and I'll try to do them uh, via Zoom or go to meeting so that a lot of people can participate um, from across the state or across the nation or across the world. So let me know if you have ideas on, I've thought about maybe like how to submit poems to journals because Pest Puddles is one of the places that a lot of you have submitted poems, but not everyone is Pest Puddles, not everyone has the same rules. So. Um, I, don't know, I just thought about different ideas. So if you have any themes or questions or anything like that, just email me and and I'll see what what's happening this summer or um, in the fall. I think once the pandemic ends, I think a lot of people will be wanting face to face things to happen. But I don't know. I've sure learned a lot about the benefits of this kind of gathering, um, especially in a rural state. So I'm I'm hoping that we can still do both of those kinds of things. So. Well, awesome. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Christine. Thank you, uh, Marilyn, Brenda, Jamie, and Teresa for joining us. Thank you for our other participants. Um, so, yeah, thanks for joining me this evening, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, thanks to all of you. <laughs>